This is Heather Vox from The Million Person Project, and The Million Person Project is a global project about love, storytelling, and connecting change makers. And I am excited today to be here with Michael Margolis from Get Storied, and we are going to be having a conversation about the power of stories. So, hi Michael. Hey Heather. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself to the viewers? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm an educator, I'm an anthropologist, and I'm a storyteller. And for the last 15 years have been looking at storytelling in the context of innovation. So how um, change agents, how entrepreneurs and cultural creatives, uh, how do you actually tell that story when what you're doing by definition is disruptive, uh, challenges people's current understanding of the world? Well, thank you so much for joining this conversation with me today. Of course. <laughs> and one of the things that I would love to hear from you is just what is your personal story in relationship to stories? How yeah. come, why stories? It's like the saying goes, we, we teach what we need to learn most. The short end of it, I used to suck at telling my story. Mm. Like I've always been good with, with, with words, good with ideas, yet I would find myself in really high stakes, high pressure situations, completely tongue tied and twisted. One of the moments that, that it really hit me, I was 23 years old, uh, I was a social entrepreneur, sort of my first career right out of college. And like a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, I used to work double shifts. And one of my mentors who was like my, my, my board chair, uh, he used to work alongside me. And we once met at like 1030 at night. Uh, and there were some really big things that were going on in this organization at the time that I was running. I'd been totally flying by the seat of my pants, mm. figuring everything out as I went. But within about 12 months, like we'd had people like the Rockefeller Foundation funding us mm. and uh, a lot of things, exciting things that were happening. And I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right. But here I was running this thing. And, you know, because I was very committed to it, we're doing work around the digital divide. And I w went into this meeting and to make a long story short, I got so tongue-tied and twisted, I literally started choking on my own tongue. Mm. Uh, to the point where my mentor like thought I needed to go to the hospital. Oh no. Because I just, I was so frustrated and I didn't know how to communicate what I really needed mm. or what needed to change. And that was a bit of a wake-up call for me then. Um, and it's not like everything magically changed overnight. That episode in my life of about two and a half years as a social entrepreneur, because you know, about 12 months in, we got all this funding and great things. And about 12 months later, epic crash and burn. Mm -hmm. Everything fell in on itself. It's the classic startup story, mm -hmm. right? Picking up the pieces from that experience, I had the sense something was missing from the conversation. Mm -hmm. Like the way that we talk about social innovation. As an anthropologist, I was like, oh, there's something about culture, about identity, uh, you know, People wanted to tell the like save the inner city story, all these like cliches that just kind of felt gross to me. You know, it, it's been about 15 years of just exploring that riddle. Um, and in the process, looking at my own life experiences too, of you know having grown up across a lot of different cultures, coming from a very untraditional, unconventional childhood, and then seeing how you know, the internet and innovation economy the last 15 years means that we're all doing something new and different. Mm -hmm. And how do you tell that story? Mm. And how do you do it in a way that doesn't, that doesn't have to be adversarial, mm. that doesn't have to be so bloody? What do you mean by unconventional childhood? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, so, I mean, picture this. My dad is a mad scientist and inventor. Wow. Born in the bush of Africa. Uh, if you think of like Doc Brown from Back to the Future, mm. that's my dad. Oh, wow. Okay. And then my mom uh, is a teacher, artist, and toy designer who grew up in the frozen tundra of upstate New York. My mom's like Mary Poppins. So you can imagine <laughs> like I'm the mutant love child of these two characters. Mm. And, you know, I lived in a household where creativity ruled the house. Mm. We also grew up... Uh, as expats, first nine years of my life in Switzerland. And I mentioned my dad being from Africa. So there's always been this sense of sort of being the misfit. Hmm. Like we don't really fit in or belong anywhere. And yet we kind of have a unique perspective on things. Hmm. Uh, so both of my parents are absolute uh, iconoclastic visionaries 
who see things that other people don't see and have devoted their life to that inquiry. Mm. And then I've also seen them at times struggle the challenges of how to get others to see what they see. Mm -hmm. And likewise, right, I've experienced the same thing. What, what, do, you, what do you mean people? How come people don't see the bigger story? Mm. It's so obvious to me. Mm. But then, you know, how do I explain this? Um, and oftentimes it feels really subtle. It's these little nuances. And, and we often aren't even aware of sort of the hidden elements to how we're framing and presenting mm. our story. And that it might actually repel and push people away more than attract. Mm. I was blessed, you know, growing up in, in, in my household. I never knew if my day would be a, a science experiment or an art project. Mm. Um, and my mom is big into uh, assemblage art. So we, you know, once we moved to, to Los Angeles, we didn't have cars in the garage. Instead, it was our atelier. It was our workshop filled with materials. Cool. And we would go to garage sales. And what everybody else was throwing away as trash, we would uh, buy. And they would become the, the materials for building worlds. Worlds in a box. Uh, and so I learned at a very young age, actually, the process of of telling stories. For people's birthdays or anniversaries, weddings, we would build them a world in a box wow. based on their life story. <laughs> well, the thing that strikes me about what you're saying is it's something that I talk about a lot in my work about letting the nuances of what is exist. Yeah. And how so many times when we come to tell our stories, we think, oh, we need it to be like this linear thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I struggled with this and then I overcame and now this is why I know you yes. can overcome too. <laughs> and like all of the nuances. Sunflowers and lollipops. Yeah. And yes. all of the nuances are, are lost in that. Yes. So I'd love to hear what you think is how to construct a story. Like what is the pathway? Sure. Well, so let's kind of set the table because I think that there's... There's a few really important elements that we tend to overlook or underestimate, especially as a change agent. And that is the, the biggest obstacle you face as a change agent is disbelief. Hmm. What are you talking about? Are you for real? What is, this, what is it that you're selling me? Hmm. Uh, can I trust you? Hmm. So disbelief, disbelief is the obstacle, the biggest obstacle that we face. And so if disbelief is that obstacle, we have to approach the construction and the framing of our narrative in a very specific way. The first thing that we have to do is answer the number one question in the back of everybody's mind, which is, Are you just trying to sell me more shit? Hmm. Or do you give a shit hmm. about my world and making it better? Are you selling crap or do you give a crap? I'm being a little over dramatic here, mm -hmm. but it's this notion of, do I belong in this story? Hmm. Is this story for me? Hmm. So we're making split second decisions every single day of our life. When you open your email inbox, when you're looking at your social media feeds, mm -hmm. when, right? All of these demands for our attention, we're basically asking ourselves, do I belong in this story? Mm. Okay, so that, that's part of setting the table. We gotta recognize there's disbelief, mm. and then people are asking, do I belong in this story? So then the question is, well, how do you create the conditions mm -hmm. for receptivity? We actually have a, a methodology called Lean Story, uh, and, and it's a six step methodology. We teach the short version of it in three steps. Uh, so the first step of lean story is what we call finding the frame. And finding the frame quite simply is about context. And when you set context, what you need to do is you need to describe the change. Mm. What is changing in the world? And what is possible because of that? Mm. You see, we've all been taught to start with the problem. Mm -hmm. But when you start with the problem, you actually put people on the defensive. You mm -hmm. get people to shut down. Because, let's be honest, who likes to talk about our problems? Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine you, you walk home, um, you, know, you walk in the door after a long day's work and you're you know, greeted by your significant other and they go, Heather, 
we've got a problem. Let's mm-hmm. sit down. <laughs> right? How are you feeling in that moment? Yeah, dread. Right? <laughs> you're like, oh, crap, what did I do? Oh, man, this is going to be a heavy trip you're about to lay on me. Right? And then your partner lays a heavy trip on you, and you're defensive. You feel like crap. You don't really know what to think. But then they go, okay, but all right, don't worry. I have the answer. I know exactly what you need to do. <laughs> How does that story go? Yeah, it's not a good story. Okay. So we all know this intuitively mm-hmm. in our interactions with our intimates. Mm-hmm. And yet what we're all doing as yeah. change agents, we go out in the world and we're saying, that's wrong. This is right. Mm-hmm. When the subject matter, when the story is tough yes and you are speaking to the people who are playing a role in perpetuating the story or the status quo that is not serving you or the community at large what do you believe is the most important thing to be able to create receptivity yeah what goes back to are you creating room in the story for this person to self-identify in a way where they are not the victim or the victimizer. Who wants to be cast in that role? And it's a real practice to cultivate around really cultivating empathy and compassion Mm -hmm. in a way that's about not about making our audience wrong, but actually, again, bringing forward this paradox or this dilemma, Mm. the challenge of our time. Take something like, say, global warming, climate change. You know, how how do you engage people on a a cause or an issue like that? Uh, Or take something like homelessness. I've never been homeless. I don't know anybody who's been homeless directly. So how do I relate to that? So you got to like figure out what are the angles that make it more relatable. Like I haven't been homeless, but I do know what it feels like to not have enough money to afford a warm enough winter coat Mm. to get through a New England winter. Mm. You know, and to have to wear like six layers, Mm. sweaters and long johns Mm -hmm. and like really crappy jackets to like stay warm. And I'm always, I'm always cold. I don't stay warm enough. Not having enough money um, that I had to like scrounge in my living room sofa to find enough change to go buy like a $5 lunch. In your life where you just feel so completely, utterly alone, Mm. even though you know you could turn to family or certain people, you're like... You're going through a hard time and you know people could bail you out or support Mm -hmm. you, but you have so much pride and sort of this stubbornness of like, I can't let somebody see me like this. Those are examples of like, oh, well, those are potential pathways Mm -hmm. into a shared empathic empathic experience. So what does it feel like not to have a home? Um, In a a home where like, you know, like for instance, I am actually, I am homeless. I'm a nomad Mm -hmm. for the last 10 months, but it's a different kind of homeless Mm -hmm. um, versus like living on the streets. Mm -hmm. So, you know, or take something like, you know, like climate change. It's really hard to wrap one's hands around that at a personal level. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I belong in this story? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, I know. Okay. We're we're looking at the potential annihilation of our species over the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. Like I can intellectually get that, but it's so abstract And I feel like such a lack of personal agency. Mm -hmm. How will little old me do anything on that Mm. to make a difference? You know, so it just brings up a sense of hopelessness, a sense of existential, Mm -hmm. right? Sort of like nihilism. It's Mm -hmm. like, oh my God, what can I do? Just makes you depressed, Mm -hmm. right? Makes you feel like crap about yourself and about the world. And I've spent some time with a few big environmental organizations and and a lot of the work that we have focused on is how to take the issue of environmentalism and and to really help people build a more personal relationship Mm -hmm. to their local environment, Mm -hmm. right? Because so many of us, you know, if you're living an urban centered life, you don't really have a relationship to story of place. You've Mm -hmm. probably moved around a whole bunch. Maybe you've only lived in your town for three or five years. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, like we're not connected to making, for many of us, unless you're, you know, a hipster in Oakland or Brooklyn or or Portland, like you don't make your own food. You know, you don't grow your own sprouts or make your own cheese. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason why those things are coming back about. But there's a way that so many aspects of the natural world are foreign to us. Mm -hmm. And it feels kind of scary. So it's this notion of how do you make friends 
with the natural world. Mm -hmm. And from that place, then you start to care about it. Mm -hmm. Then you start to realize, oh, yeah, this is my home. This is my community. Mm -hmm. And and I want to be involved in taking care of this place. Mm -hmm. I have a sense of ownership over place. But if you don't address the fact that so many of us feel transient, alienated, Mm -hmm. sort of, oh, I'm just passing through. Mm -hmm. And... I don't know, like, do I really belong here? Is this my community? Am I, is this my neighborhood? Do I know my neighbors? Mm-hmm. It becomes really hard to get people to care about the environment. People are just struggling to put food on the table and a roof over their heads mm-hmm. and, and feel like they're just passing through. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's elements of this. It's just like coming back to the fundamentals mm-hmm. of, of what does it feel like to really feel like you've landed in your life, to feel mm-hmm. like you've landed in community to feel like you've landed in relationship to others. Mm-hmm. And we have to look at those fundamentals and, and to tell bigger stories about that, mm-hmm. bigger stories about the human experience. And we have to approach it with compassion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really a process of nurturance mm-hmm. and looking at where's the fertile soil. Mm-hmm. You know, the last quick thing that I'll mention on this, we spend way too much time trying to convince the naysayers instead of paying attention to where's the fertile soil. There are so many people who naturally identify to the work that you're doing. Draw them in, Mm -hmm. find your true believers, Mm -hmm. nurture them, cultivate them, gather that tribe, focus on fertile soil instead of hard asphalt. Mm -hmm. Because there's so, such an energy suck. And there's so much energy that we put on needing to convert. Yeah, yeah. You know? And if somebody is on a really fixed position, it's like trying, it it's trying to, it's trying to, you're pushing against a wall mm-hmm. or it's like Sisyphus pushing a rock up a hill. Mm-hmm. I know where to find you next week. Mm-hmm. You're going to be pushing that same rock up that same hill. Mm-hmm. And to what end? Mm-hmm. Right? Like to what cost does that come to your own self, you know, health and well being? Mm-hmm. I've gone through multiple cycles of, Uh, you know, the entrepreneurial sort of cycles of like full tilt, complete burnout, Mm -hmm. you know, physical breakdown, you know, like, and and it's one of the big shadow aspects of being the change agent and Mm -hmm. the innovator is we don't always pick the the right or the best battles to fight. Yeah, well, I just love the idea of in our stories to make room for other people in our stories. And even if it's someone that you're working against or that's how you feel yeah. it's how does your story invite them to be a part of it so thank you so much for sharing with us today oh, and really where welcome. can people learn about oh, the, sure. work, the work that you're yeah. doing and more about these steps and how to tell stories and yeah and so audiences. come join us at getstoried.com and uh, if you go to getstoried.com forward slash red pill you can take uh, our free storytelling mini course. Just like Neo in the Matrix, you take the red pill, you will never look at storytelling in your life the same. And you can also then check out the new About Me. That's uh, one of our online courses that teaches you how to share your personal story in a professional context. So it's the story of who you are, what you do, who you serve, and the fact that before any business meeting, you've been Googled. People are going to experience your story before they experience you in real life. So how do you tell that story authentically? Mm. How do you tell that story without bragging, without boasting, without sounding like a jerk? So we have a seven-step methodology around that. Uh, you can also check me out on Twitter, at Get Storied. We've got more than a quarter million followers. I share a lot through Twitter. I'm also in the midst of a story world tour. I'm teaching all around the world in 2016, in North America, in Australia, India, and Europe. So if you go to our website, you can find out about those various programs. And if you get on our email list, you can learn if we are coming to your town or community. And uh, in the meantime, we got lots of great stuff online in our learning platform. So we're here to support you, especially as a change agent and innovator. Absolutely love uh, the work that you're doing, Heather, in in really inspiring us and provoking us to really look at what story are we telling and is it the right story for the future we want to create. I'm so incredibly inspired and touched by the work that you're up to and the gift of this uh, of this storytelling series. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation and thank you viewers for tuning in and 
Check out Michael at getstoried.com and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bye. Mm-hmm.